The most frequent themes of Hieronymus Bosch's paintings are the follies and the sins of mankind, and he's famous for painting the monstrous devils and the high-bred creatures. The most famous of his paintings is known as the Garden of Earthly Delights. Now, we don't know what Bosch called it. That is a conventional name that has been given to it. So when you say the Garden of Earthly Delights or even the Garden of Delights, uh, people will know which of Bosch paintings you refer to. As we will see, the iconography is very controversial. Now, first, I just wanted you to take a little look at uh, the right wing of this painting. It's a triptych. And this shows the hell scene, and it's here to illustrate all of these monstrous devils and uh, creatures here. Uh, you have the uh, total image, and then you have this detail of the lower part, and you can see Satan uh, on a potty chair, as it were, uh, eating, devouring sinners and defecating them down into a cesspool. And you can see the musicians uh, literally hung up on their instruments. Uh, so you have also a sense of that he's trying to create this feeling of smell and uh, sound as well as sight. Now, why would musicians be tormented like that? Well, it was believed that the musicians uh, who accompanied song or who played musical instruments such as the lute or the harp, uh, that they often uh, put people in a, a lascivious mood. Uh, you know, you think about the troubadour singing love songs or uh, someone having the musicians playing uh, as uh, they meet uh, their lover. Um, church music was primarily plain song with no musical accompaniment. So presumably, uh, these musicians abated in the sin of lust. This is the painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights. And as you can see, it's laid out as a triptych. The left wing, or left side panel, is the Garden of Eden. And then in the center, there's this very unusual scene. You know, there's nothing else like it in the history of art, uh, with all of these nude people uh, cavorting. That's the word I tend to use. Um, and you have uh, giant plants and pods and strange structures, and we'll be talking about some of those. And then the scene that you just saw on the right, the hell scene. Well, let's, let's start talking about the style and composition first. As you can see, it's laid out with a very clearly distinct foreground, middle ground, background, and even a very far distant background with these, these hazy blue mountains. But it also extremely high horizon. And with all the little figures and objects going on throughout the, uh, the panel, it sometimes gives a feeling of a kind of overall surface pattern if you stand back and look at it. It's been compared almost to a tapestry. And here's a little detail so you can see some of the figures. Uh, all these figures look almost identical. Uh, you've got male figures, you've got female figures, and you have a few African figures. But they, we tend to think of them almost like little dolls because they have very little shading. So they don't have that um, volumetric chiaroscuro, but they do turn in space. As you can see, they can be in all sorts of different poses. And even closer. Okay, I said there was controversial iconography. And there are numerous interpretations of this, and I'm just listing a few of them. We're going to talk more about the moral lesson, the moral interpretation, the heretical interpretation, and the alchemical interpretation. But here's just a list. Um, 
the oldest and um, longest running, if you will, interpretation has been uh, an interpretation based on the idea that this has a moral message. You know, that's a kind of moral lesson um, about what you should not be doing. Uh, another idea is that it shows uh, the people before Noah's flood uh, and on the exterior, it shows the flood of Noah. And we'll be looking at that as well as the interior. Uh, the idea is that you have you know, the Garden of Eden, and then in the center, people sinning. And of course, these people all go to hell. Uh, and then on the outside, you have a, an image, as we will see, of the world. And um, that interpretation thinks this is Noah's flood. Now, we do have a painting uh, by Bosch or attributed to Bosch of Noah's flood, and it doesn't you know, quite look like that at all. Another interpretation, which I'm going to talk to you about, is this idea that this was a heretical altarpiece. And then there have been many alchemical interpretations, um, but there's one that has emerged, well, in it was a dissertation of 1980, and it was uh, presented at a conference in 1980, and it was published in 1981, and I'm, I'm going to talk to you about that one because it was a different kind of allegorical, uh, it was a different kind of alchemical allegory. And a fairly recently published book uh, has suggested that this uh, scene in the center represents the golden age of mankind when Shepherds and nymphs just lived in peace and harmony, and they made music, and they made love, and they had fun in the sunshine. And I guess the sheep and goats took care of themselves. There aren't really, there's a, I think there's a goat in there, but uh, I'm not sure about any sheep. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's a, a recent interpretation. Now, these are the three interpretations I'm going to talk to you about. Um, I think that there's probably most truth in the moral and the alchemical um, ideas about what's going on here. I should tell you one thing. Um, I think we've mentioned Erwin Panofsky before, the great iconographer of uh, Renaissance art. And when he wrote his book on early Netherlandish painting, he ended it with Bosch. And what he said was that he wasn't going to do an interpretation of you know, Bosch Garden of Delights or his work, he said, it's too high for my wit. And when you hear that, you think, oh my goodness, why would anybody tackle it? Well, obviously, many, many scholars have tackled it, um, even if Panofsky was reluctant to take it on. So the first interpretation I'm going to talk to you about, and I'm going to say something that I rarely say, this is wrong. And I can prove it. Now, there may be times when I disagree with an interpretation, and, and you know, I'll point that out. Um, but I might, you know, find something, or I might understand why they thought that that particular meaning was attached to a particular painting. Uh, but in this case, I find it a little more difficult. But so why am I talking to you about it? Well, I'm talking to you about it because it pops up in popular literature, in newspaper articles, when people hear this and they just repeat it without knowing what the evidence is. Okay, this was an interpretation that was published in articles and books uh, by Franginger. And Franginger thought that the Garden of Delights was an altarpiece for a heretical cult, which was called the Adamites, or the Brethren of the Free Spirit. Now, why do I say this is false? Well, it's ahistorical. The Adamites did not live in the time of Hieronymus Bosch. They were a century earlier. The last time they were heard of was in Brussels in 1416. And that's when they're heard of. It's a heresy trial, and it's the records for the heresy trial. 
Uh, and during this trial, they are accused of practicing free love. And that's probably what Frankenstein latched on to. He thought all these people in the center uh, who were cavorting uh, were practicing free love. And so it must be the Adamites. But the Adamites were never in Sehatogan's Bosch. And the last mention was that heresy trial of 1416. Now, Hieronymus Bosch died in 1516. And you know, we have the drawing from the Codex Aurus where he looks to be an old man. But I think it's beyond possibility that he was old enough to have been um, an adult and practicing heresy in 1416. I doubt that he was even a glimmer in his father's eye in 1416. Um, it just seems beyond credulity. Okay, what other evidence would we have besides, wait, 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 you know, it's the wrong time and place. Every indication suggests that Bosch was a faithful Christian. He was not a heretic, and there was no hint of heresy attached to him or his work. And the reason I say that is because what do we know about him? Well, we know that he was a member of the confraternity of Our Lady of the Snow. Now, this was a prestigious confraternity. A confraternity is a um, religious organization that takes lay people. I suppose the closest equivalent we have today might be something like the Knights of Columbus for the Catholics or the, the, the um, Masons, you know, and the Eastern Star for the women, uh, for the Protestants. Um, but essentially it's a religious organization. It's made up primarily of lay people and they're very orthodox. Uh, you know, there's no flirting with heresy in these, these confraternities. Also, Bosch received commissions from his local church. Now, we know that um, many of those, most of, well, they don't survive, let's put it that way. Um, but the fact that he received the commissions suggests that there was no hint of heresy attached. Uh, the penalty for heresy was death. And no, there's no indication of that at all. And uh, I don't see Bosch painting for heretics, uh, no matter how much they were willing to pay, for, pay him. Uh, also, we know something about who may have owned this painting. The Count of Nassa owned it in 1517. Now, that's Nassa in the Netherlands, not the Caribbean island. Um, and then it went to the collection, eventually, to the collection of the King of Spain, Philip II. Now, you may know about Philip II. The Inquisition was very, very strong under Philip II. If there was a hint of heresy about someone, that they would be tortured and executed. Even conversos, um, people who had converted from Judaism or Islam, uh, were under great suspicion. And if they were found to relapse, uh, of course, they were considered her I say, of course. Uh, a lot of these people were just simply forcibly baptized, and then you know, now you're a Christian, and if you relapse, you're a heretic. Well, you know, that's horrifying to us today. Um, on other occasions, someone may have con sincerely converted, but if their parents had been Muslim or their parents had been Jewish, they were liable to receive the attention of the Inquisition. And the King of Spain was the great supporter and promoter of the Spanish Inquisition. If he had owned paintings that he suspected might have the hint of heresy, those paintings would have been burnt. And so we sincerely doubt that he regarded these jewels of his collection as um, heretical. Uh, 
or even suspected such a thing about them. In 1600, this painting was owned by the King of Spain. And it's from that period that we have the very first written interpretation that has survived. Now, this was written by Fra Jose de Seguenza, and he doesn't call the painting the Garden of Earthly Delights. That comes much, much later, centuries later. What he calls the painting is the strawberry plant. Now, you can kind of see why. Uh, if you're standing in front of that painting, it's hanging on the wall, and we don't know how high it was hanging, but down in the lower part of the painting, you have, I have this little detail here of uh, the people with the giant berries, and one person uh, chomping on a strawberry, and another berry that's open and spilling out its, its uh, fruit or its seeds. That's, you know, very prominent. That's right there up in front. So it must have impressed him. And he gives the whole painting the name, the strawberry plant. But why? Well, he tells us. He says that when you, when you eat a strawberry, when you take a bite, it is so sweet. But shortly thereafter, it has no taste. The taste doesn't last. And he uses this to make a kind of uh, analogy between the strawberry plant, which has sweet taste, but it just doesn't last, and the transitory nature of sensual pleasures. Because fairly obviously, there are sensual pleasures going on in the central um, panel of this painting. You know, there's uh, uh, sexual activity, there's uh, eating of giant fruits, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of cavorting going on, as we might say. Um, now, this is, and he's very clear about, this is a vanitas theme. Okay, what's that mean? Well, vanitas is a Latin word for vanity. And of course, in English, vanity means a lot of things. It means somebody, oh, you're full of pride of your appearance, uh, or uh, we have a or a piece of furniture that we call a vanity, where people, women sit at and put on makeup. Um, actually, the word for pride was superbia. And was, of course, one of the seven deadly sins, superbia. Um, vanitas refers to verses in Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes, uh, the prophet names various things in the world. And then he says, you know, it's like, it's, well, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but it's, you know, it's useless, you're just going to die. And there's a repeated refrain of vanity, vanity, all is vanity. One of them, incidentally, is about much study, is a trouble. You know, it's Difficult. And even if you get this, what, scholarly perfection, you're just gonna die. You can't take it with us. You can't take it with you, is, is you know, how we might put it today. So all things of the world are in vain. It's pretty depressing, actually. However, the way the Christians interpreted that book of the Bible was that all worldly things are in vain. And then they felt the implication was that spiritual matters you could take with you. Uh, that all these worldly things, you know, they profited you nothing in the long run. You know, you have to put your mind on spiritual matters in order to go to heaven. And the worldly matters will just lead you straight to hell. Now, vanitas themes are very prevalent in the history of art. Uh, when you're at the 17th century, for example, uh, not in this course, but uh, perhaps in a Baroque course, you'll be seeing vanitas still lifes, in which you had st would have uh, images of various things, such as fruit, which might you know, slightly be turning a little too ripe. You know, fruit will decay soon. It's transitory 
or flowers which are drooping or little insects or uh, mice or something like this that could you know, eat away, represent time. Hourglasses are frequent, even skulls sometimes in them. So there's a lot of different ways that artists will tell you uh, that transitory nature of human pleasure, that uh, all of the pleasures of life and the pleasures of um, the senses simply don't last. You've got to think about spiritual things. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. So that is how he interpreted it. And you can see the image with the uh, strawberries, the big fruit down here in the foreground. Okay, that is the oldest interpretation. And you know, for many centuries, including today, uh, that is a prevailing interpretation. We may not call it strawberry plant, but the moral inter interpretation certainly seems to be the one that you would look at when you see it. I mean, you do have hell there. It does seem to suggest something. So what I'm going to show you uh, first is uh, the moral interpretation. Now, we don't have time to go into every single figure, object, animal, plant uh, in this painting. I'm just going to show you a few representative uh, samples. Now, one of the people who has written widely on this is Walter Gibson. He's written a book on Hieronymus Bosch. He's written an article um, on uh, Bosch's Garden of Delights. Um, Jim Snyder also used the moral interpretation when he wrote his book on the, on Hieronymus Bosch. So it's a very prevalent uh, viewpoint. And you know, it's very clear actually in a sense because you look at the right panel and you see Eden. And it kind of looks like uh, Adam is being introduced to Eve. We'll take a closer look at that image, of course. Uh, then you go on and in the center you have nude figures cavorting. Uh, presumably this means that uh, sinful mankind is progressing from Eden, where human beings first came into being, and they start sinning and they continue to sin. So there they are, their sinful existence on earth. And where does that lead them? They just end up in the right panel, hell. Walter Gibson pointed out that we have another painting by Hieronymus Bosch, which is laid out in a very similar way. And by historical coincidence, it is also in the same room in the Museo del Prado uh, in Madrid. Uh, of course, the Prado was the uh, royal palace of the kings of Spain, also the Escorial. Uh, so uh, much of the art collection of the kings of Spain uh, is now the basis of the Prado Museum. And they have a Bosch room. And in that room are um, a number of paintings, including these two. Okay, what is this other painting? It's called the Haywain Triptych. Uh, a Haywain looks like, so, a Haywain means a hay wagon. And so right there in the front, you see a hay wagon. So as I say, it's laid out in a very similar fashion. You have a triptych. On the left wing, you have uh, scenes of the Garden of Eden. They're a little bit different, as you can see, but you have Adam and Eve going through the whole story of the, you know, the earliest sections of Genesis. And then you have this strange center you know, that just seems to call for some kind of iconographic interpretation. And you just can't take that one by saying, oh yeah, I saw that the other day. It's, it's an unusual scene in the middle. And then on the right, just like in the Garden of Delights, uh, you see hell, and you know, there's no doubt that that is hell, uh, with the burning city and the uh, uh, horrible devils. Okay. The point is that this painting is much easier to interpret than the Garden of Delights, because we have essentially the key. In the center, you have a hay wagon, right? And you have people grabbing for hay trying to get all the hay they can. Well, there is a Netherlandish proverb. They love 
Proverbs in the Netherlands. And the proverb goes, all the world's a haystack and everyone grabs from it what he can. So all those worldly things, everybody wants them. They want more money. They want more power. They want more sex. <laughs> you know, they want these worldly things. They want more food and drink and, you know, whatever they want. Um, and everyone is grabbing what he can. Now, this has also been related to a verse in the Bible uh, from Isaiah. It says, all flesh is grass. Uh, the idea that like grass, you know, human existence in the physical form, all flesh, uh, can be just burnt up in a second. It talks about the grass, which just burns up and is gone. And that's like the life of man. You know, you have you're there a brief moment and it's over. You're gone. Both of them, you know, reflect to what? Something that is transitory, you know, something people may want very much. And let's see what happens. Okay, so all the world's a haystack. All those worldly pleasures and desires like power and wealth and lust and uh, food and drink. I mean, you have to have a certain amount to live, but you know, excessive food and drink, let's say, uh, are worthless. They're nothing but hay. They're not gonna get you into heaven. They're not gonna help you when you die. They're nothing but hay. You know, essentially a worthless thing. You know, use it for bedding down animals. So that is, in many ways, a Vanitas theme. So we have another Vanitas here. Well, let's take a closer look at what's going on here. In the left wing, at the very top, we see God the Father and the fall of the rebel angels. Now that's not in the Bible. No, that um, comes from other sources. But it is the idea that some of the angels, Satan was the leader, rebelled against God's authority. And they were cast out of heaven and they became the devils. And then you see human existence with the very first parents. So you have here uh, in the background uh, the creation of Eve. You know, she's rising out of the side of Adam, you know, out of his rib, as it were. And then, a little further down, you see original sin, the fall of man, where Satan tempts human beings and they eat from the forbidden fruit. The one thing God had told them not to do was to eat of the tree of knowledge. So now they know both good and evil. And they are expelled from paradise. And so here's the angel chasing them out of paradise. It looks like Adam may be objecting a bit. Uh, Eve, uh, her hand is to her cheek in distress, is looking right into the next panel. as okay, that's where we've got to go next, maybe. The next panel, the all the world's a haystack panel, has this very, very prominent hay wagon. You'll notice who's who's pulling it are these devils, these little monsters, and they are literally pulling it right into the next scene, the hell scene. But you have people who are grabbing at that hay. They are fighting everybody for the hay. Uh, they're, one person's murdering somebody right down here in the uh, uh, lower, uh, just beyond the, the basic foreground between the uh, people in the foreground and the uh, hayway itself. You have somebody down on the ground murdering somebody for the hay. Uh, there's one guy who's caught his hay and he's right under the wheel. He's going to be crushed under the wheel the next moment. Down in the foreground, you have uh, all of these nuns pulling up all this hay to feed to this very corpulent uh, monk. And this is probably a commentary on the glutton tree and uh, loose ways uh, that some of the clergy uh, were supposed to participate. Well, not, they weren't supposed to participate in it, were believed to participate. And there are all sorts of stories um, in the 
14th century and the 15th century, and I'm sure on, uh, about uh, monks who did not follow their, vo their vows. You know, they were corpulent, they were lustful, um, they did all the sinning. Um, but here, of course, we can see that, you know, maybe that feast that's going to be laid out for him will be nothing but hay. And then you see the quack doctor. That's another way of getting your hay, you know, getting your money. Um, the little group of, uh, of women there, um, not quite sure about that. They've, it's been suggested that they may be gypsies who are famous for um, chicanery. Um, when you're in Europe, uh, watch your pocketbook or if gypsies are around. Um, at any rate, uh, you know, we have all these sort of ordinary people trying to get that hay. But if you look who's following the hay wagon, who are assured of hay, you know, <laughs> these are the wealthy and powerful. There's a pope and kings and dukes and uh, you know, just all of the wealthy and the powerful on their horses uh, following the hay because that's what they are most interested in. Not spiritual matters, but what power, wealth, hay, <laughs> nothing but hay. Okay, now at the very top, you see Jesus. He's up there in the clouds. We'll take a little closer look at him. And on the top of the hay wing, we have a little scene of a garden of love. And you can see there's a, what, a bush growing there. There's, there's one of those uh, sinful musicians making music uh, to sort of help uh, the couples in their uh, amorous dalliance. So uh, you have uh, two sets of lovers, uh, a musician, and you'll notice that the little devil with them is uh, literally piping them to hell with the, the, the pipe is made of it. The pipe is made out of his nose. So it's this long pipe. He's, he's piping them away. And, you know, there's only one figure in this entire uh, composition before you get up to Jesus that seems to be having any spiritual, you know, in, any interest in spiritual matters. And that is this little angel. And he is praying so hard as he looks up to Christ. You know, he's just there on his knees praying for these people. Okay, so here we see them. The angel's looking up, praying for them. They are completely ignoring Jesus. And he's shown as a man of sorrows. He's displaying his wounds. He's looking down from heaven at, at sinful mankind saying, uh, I, I died for your sins. Uh, excuse me, I'm up here. Uh, you really should behave better. <laughs> Whatever. You know, he's calling attention to the fact that he died to save them. And yet they're still pursuing the hay. Those things which will only bring them to hell, not to heaven. So, comparing the two, in both there's Eden, where mankind begins to sin. In the center, Mankind is continuing to sin. Um, you know, in the Garden of Delights, they are having giant fruit and lots of erotic activities. Uh, and then in both, the, in both of these, pan, uh, these paintings, the right wing is hell, where mankind is punished for his sin. So... Walter Gibson and, and many others, you know, believe that this is, the, you might say, the key to the Garden of Delights. Um, that uh, we have man comes into being, he sins, and he ends up in hell. And here's a, another example. This is one of the details. Uh, they call this the cavalcade. And as you can see, uh, the nude men in Bosch's painting are riding all of these different kinds of animals. Uh, and uh, they seem to be trying to attract the attention of the lovely ladies who are bathing in the nude. They're skinny dipping in the pond. Uh, water is often considered to be, um, what uh, St. Jerome says, about moist places are symbols of lust. Uh, and a lot of these different animals do have associations with sins. Um, because of a verse in Isaiah that says that, Every man neighed after his neighbor's wife. Horses are sometimes considered to be uh, lustful creatures. Uh, goats, of course, you probably know that, are associated with uh, lust and even with the devil. Some of they have some great cats here that might be lions or uh, some other uh, you know, type of wild, uh, ferocious animal. Uh, those might be associated with collar. 
you know, and anger and wrath. Pretty much different thing, different names for the same thing. Uh, pigs, of course, were associated with gluttony. Uh, stags also sometimes associated with lust. Uh, and then some of them are just exotic beasties. Now, look down at this um, pretty crude woodcut. It's a late 15th century German woodcut. And it represents the seven deadly sins uh, all on different animals, carrying banners which show other different animals, and they're following Satan. Now, in this case, the sins are female. And I should uh, also, in full disclosure, tell you that uh, some of these books also have virtues as female figures riding on animals. Uh, but as you can see, you have this idea of the sins following Satan uh, you know, on these exotic beasties. And uh, you know, this seems to be a kind of parallel to what you see uh, in Bosch's painting. Here we look at it again. There is, you know, that seems to be very clear. And it seems to be a really um, straightforward interpretation in many ways. Uh, when you get into the details, it gets uh, really, you know, intriguing, if you will. There's one thing, though, that makes you wonder just a little bit if that's all there is to it. If this was showing you sinful mankind. Why, in the Garden of Eden, are you not showing the fall of man? Wouldn't that make it, wouldn't that make the point really strong? So, you know, is it just that when man came into being, we know that they're going to be sinning and we can see they're sinning and we can see they go to hell here? Or is there some other reason for that? Well, in 1980, I went to the College Art Association meeting, which was held that year in New Orleans. And there was a paper given by Lorinda Dixon. Um, she, had, she was just receiving her doctorate from uh, Boston University, and she is now a professor at Syracuse University. And she had a most intriguing interpretation for Hieronymus Bosch. Um, the next year, her dissertation book came out, and in the Art Bulletin of uh, 1981, the March edition, uh, was her article about this. Now, there had been other alchemical interpretations before Lorinda Dixon. Most of them, you know, would be the idea of alchemists as evildoers, you know, who are uh, so interested in trying to change lead into gold that you know, they neglect spiritual matters, this kind of thing. Um, when we think of alchemists today, that's kind of what we think of. Oh, alchemy, they're trying to change lead into gold. You know, they're greedy. Uh, and also they're mad scientists. That's, that's the, actually the television idea of mad scientists, I think, does come from the idea of the, the alchemist who's just obsessed you know, with his alchemy and does go mad because one of the elements that alchemists used very frequently was mercury, particularly red mercury. And red mercury is poisonous and it will drive you mad. Uh, you know, it will have a, a very bad effect on your brain and that it will kill you. So there are some recorded alchemists who, you know, died from their uh, fascination with alchemy. Okay, well that's the bad alchemists. Lorinda Dixon points out that there's another side of alchemy. Now, because they're good alchemists, maybe. Um, for one thing, uh, she calls alchemy a fossil science. In other words, it didn't, it kind of died out, it fossilized. It didn't lead directly to chemistry. Uh, you know, it's in some ways like chemistry, you're mixing things together, uh, you're, uh, you, you heat them up. They don't use Bunsen burners, they use you know, other fires, but uh, uh, they use very similar um, 
vessels. You know, some things even look like test tubes and uh, other vessels that seem similar to perhaps modern chemistry. Um, although, as I say, it's not a direct link. It's what she calls a fossil science. But she defined alchemy a little bit differently than our conventional approach. She pointed out that alchemy was supposed to be, you know, really was the science of distillation. And it was very much related to medieval medicine. And you had people who were, the, you might call them the good alchemists. How do you use distillation, not to change lead into gold, but to make medicines, for example. And so this would be, you know, our apothecary. You'll remember that Bosch's in-laws were apothecaries. They were, uh, you know, what we today we call pharmacists or chemists. Um, also, in most places, the St. Luke's Guild was the guild of the painters, the physicians, and the apothecaries. So Bosch wouldn't have had any problem if he was interested at all, you know, in getting information about alchemy. Uh, presumably, if it's in there, it would be something that the patron wanted as well. Now, what do we mean by the science of distillation? The idea was that if you could distill things, you could get their essence, you know, really strong infusions of you know, whatever you're distilling. And there was also an idea of transmuting or changing one substance into another. And as I said, it's related to medieval medicine. Uh, medieval medicine is based on the four humors. You'll remember those. Melancholic, if you've got too much black bile, you're melancholic. If you've got too much yellow bile, you're choleric, angry all the time. If you've got too much phlegm, that attacks the lungs. And you're tired, you're slothful. And, you know, if blood is dominant in your makeup, you're sanguine. And, you know, you might be a little much too hail fellow well met, which is probably the best of the imbalances of humors to have uh, as far as life on Earth. Of course, the problem with being sanguine is you might forget about, you know, the future after you're dead. <laughs> the idea was that when Adam and Eve first sinned, that original sin brought, what? Sin and death into the world. It also brought disease. Because disease was ca caused by an imbalance of your humors. Before man sinned, his humors were in perfect balance. He would live forever. He would never have any illness. Everything would be peace and harmony. But when mankind sinned, when Adam and Eve first sinned, they threw their humors out of whack. And the idea was that you could cure disease if you could find a better balance of humors. So, I'll just give you an example. Everything was believed to be hot or cold, dry or moist. You know, these fours that you have. Uh, uh, four things, four elements, four uh, humors, and uh, as you can see, sort of four characteristics of those, of the uh, objects in the world. Now, if you had, let's say, a really hot fever, you're just burning up, you're dry, you're hot, you obviously need a, an infusion of something that is cold and moist. I mean, today we'd say get plenty of red rest, drink lots of fluids, cool and moist, and drink lots of orange juice, which is cold and moist. So kind of makes some sense, huh? Now, if you want to create a pill out of this or um, something to drink, you know, some kind of medicine, um, the apothecary would take something that was cold and moist and put them together and, and try to distill out, you know, the essence of this cold and moistness. 
Now, obviously, oranges would work really well. They would have been quite expensive in the Netherlands, uh, having to come from either Spain or Italy or Portugal. Um, But also, of course, as we know, uh, lots of things that were used during the Middle Ages were not what we would consider healthful. Um, they even had ideas like, uh, you know, they would grind up or dissolve pearls for the, this is the very, 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 very wealthy, as you can imagine, to drink as, as, uh, as we might take a pill. Uh, some things just didn't work. Some things did, though. I mean, because they did sometimes, they, they, you know, they knew something about what we would call herbal medicine. And that might be the housefrau, you know, the housewife who knows how to make medicine for her family. Or it could be the apothecary, you know, who professionally makes medicine. Now, these would be the people that would be considered to be the virtuous alchemists. You know, they're distilling medicines. And then you go even, and, and if you could find the perfect medicine, you know, the one, the panacea, the one that will cure all illness would be the panacea. Or what Lorinda Dixon talks about is the elixir of life. Now, probably most apothecaries, most housewives, most people who are practicing alchemy didn't think that they might someday discover the elixir of life. But for those who hope to, you know, this idea that we could restore mankind to his pre-sinful condition and to health and, you know, to, to sinlessness. If you could just find that proper, complete uh, medicine that put everything in balance, could they distill the elixir of life? No one would ever suffer, no one would ever die, uh, no one would prey on each other, everybody would, would be virtuous and disease-free and immortal. Okay, one of the things that was so convincing about Lorinda Dixon's argument was that she would take details from Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Delights and place them next to details of woodcuts or manuscript illustrations from books on alchemy or books on health. And that was what was so convincing about the argument that you could see the visual elements. You know, you didn't have to say, oh boy, this is really obscure. You'd say, well, yeah, that does look a lot like it in cruder form. Now, alchemical texts often use symbolic language and symbolic Im images to describe the process of distillation. You know, my, we might say, put two things together, heat well. Um, they would have symbolic names. Uh, and that way, you know, it was like uh, hidden from those who weren't in the know. You know, it also makes them feel so much smarter. You know, if you use big words, you feel so much smaller than if you say the same thing clearly and with uh, maybe, uh, less pretentious vocabulary, perhaps. Um, and the illustrations often do look remarkably like Bosch images. In her dissertation, uh, Dixon has 90-some of these parallels. Uh, so I'm going to show you very, very few of them. There's a lot more. OK, first, let's look at the Garden of Delights, uh, the scene of Eden. And as you can see, you have this lovely vista. Uh, you have some exotic animals back there in the middle ground. You see an elephant. You see a uh, giraffe. Uh, incidentally, those two animals are taken from a, a, a travel book. Uh, we, we know where he copied it from, actually. Uh, he'd never seen an elephant or a giraffe. Uh, then there are the unicorns whose uh, horns are purifying the water which does make you think of, you know, uh, something that's a, a healing elixir, doesn't it? And, and we'll take a closer look at this. There's uh, what's sometimes called the fountain, this uh, strange device in the middle of the pond, right there in the center of the panel. And then if we look at the foreground, we see 
And we'll take a closer look at this. We see this pool with these creatures climbing out of them. Very strange creatures. Uh, the primal pool, sometimes called. And there is a dragon tree. You may remember that from uh, Shungauer's uh, Flight into Egypt. And beneath the dragon tree sits Adam. And in the center is Christ. And he has Eve by her wrist. And some people say what he's doing is introducing Eve to Adam. Or it's sometimes called the marriage of Adam and Eve. Now, let me talk about Christ just a little bit. Some of you are saying, well, shouldn't it be God the Father? Actually, uh, the earliest images of Genesis that are known show a beardless figure with a nimmed halo, in other words, a halo with a cross in it. Um, and those are actually copies of a manuscript that was burned in the 17th century, the cotton Genesis. And uh, then there are later uh, medieval um, manuscripts and um, mosaics that show the Garden of Eden, and we believe that they're based on probably early Christian manuscripts that now have perished. Um, some things like the Granville Bible, which is a 9th century Bible, or uh, one of the uh, domes in the narthex at uh, San Marco seems to have as its source a uh, early Christian Bible, maybe the 4th or 5th century, that uh, is very close to this lost cotton Genesis, but of course we're dealing with copies. At any rate, in many of these, in most of these, uh, it is Christ who is creating in the Garden of Eden. Um, and if you think about it, well, you know, the Creed says that Christ is co-eternal with the Father. Also, he is one substance with the Father. So, you know, they are joined. You have them both at once in a sense. Also, how did creation occur? You know, God spoke. He gave the order. And Jesus in the Bible is called the Word or the verbum, or the logos, verbum being Latin, logos being Greek. You know, uh, and the word came and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So the idea that God created by the word, you know, who is identified with Christ, uh, was evidently much on the minds of those who created early Genesis scenes. And so here we do have a figure that you can call it God, you can call him Christ, and he's wearing sort of a, you know, we might say a pink or rose garment. Um, Lorinda called it red. Red is you know, the fully saturated rose. Rose is a, a light red, essentially, or pink is a light red with, with white in it. Uh, and she notes that even his face is ruddy. Um, and she points out that for alchemists, that red mercury was sometimes identified with Christ. And they thought that red mercury uh, could make this trans transmutation occur. They thought that this was a catalyst. And uh, they, you know, they actually, actually identified it symbolically with Christ. So she thinks this is a little, suggests that we may be dealing with alchemy here. There's a lot of other ones in the book. In fact, let's look at this. Uh, this is what I call, the, well, this is what we call the primal pool in which you have all of these little hybrid creatures. Now, these aren't devils. Uh, they aren't acting like devils. That's just why we can say they're not devils. We don't think they're devils. Uh, but they just seem to be little creatures that are made of different parts of other creatures. You know, here's this little seahorse unicorn, for example, or something that looks almost like a platypus. <laughs> uh, and you'll notice the three-headed bird. Well, the three-headed bird appears frequently in alchemical literature and pictures. So, you know, it's been called the alchemical bird. Uh, and some of those figures, particularly those three uh, right around our seahorse, unicorn, a horse, uh, resemble very much some figures of sort of crude woodcuts that you find in health texts and alchemical texts. Uh, I always look at this and I think of evolution. You know, I mean, evolution, what Darwin was centuries and centuries later. Uh, but you do have this little figure, you know, crawling out of the primal pool to walk on land and uh, figures that seem to be developing limbs and wings and, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, uh, 
it's, it's almost like the early stages of creation. We're trying a few things. Okay, so the left panel has been called the marriage of Adam and Eve. And that name, the marriage of Adam and Eve, in alchemical allegory, is the name of the first step of the process of distillation. When you're putting two disparate elements together in your container, say in your beaker, whatever you're using. And this little black and white drawing is from an alchemical uh, manuscript. And you can see here that Christ is, what, the red mercury? <laughs> Uh, he's marrying Adam and Eve. He's joining them. And what are Adam and Eve? Well, well, the first thing you do is to take two different things. You know, we're talking about hot, cold, warm, moist. These things that are opposites. And you're putting them together in the beaker. You're going to try to make a, an amalgamation that pure, that completely and perfectly uh, marries them together. Like those two very different things of male and female, Adam and Eve, are being wedded, joined, here literally joined at the hip in the alchemical uh, image. You also saw that throughout Bosch's painting there were these interesting structures. Every time I look at them I want to say animal, vegetable, or mineral. Uh, because you can't quite tell. Are they plant forms that are growing there? Are they something that human creations? Parts of them look quite fleshy, like are they some kind of weird animal or something like a hybrid of animal and plant, you know, uh, what could they be? Well, they're often called fountains, especially because they're in the, you know what, this one's in the middle of water and it looks like there's some water spurting out from it. So it's the alchemical, it's a fountain which Lorinda Dixon identifies with the alchemical fountain, which is found, and they, she had a number of pictures of these. I just picked out one. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, it looks sort of like a pillar. It's in the middle of a pond, uh, and you have all of this plant life around it, uh, and then Adam and Eve uh, on either side. So she suggests that this could be the alchemical fountain. And she says that each panel is another step in the process of distillation. So in a sense, when you look at this, you are creating that medicine. You know, symbolic for that. Uh, in the center, as I said, we've got our nude people cavorting, having lots of fun. Um, this, she thinks, is the alchemical allegory for the next step in the process of distillation, which is called conjunction, joining together in which the elements are joined by bubbling happily together. Now, this stage of distillation has a number of different names. One of them is child's play. Another is turning upside down. If you think of something as bubbling and it's turning and cavorting and rolling. And then there is also that idea of joining together once again. So you have this uh, analogy to, to mating behavior. So let's look at it with our alchemical text images, our little um, black and white images that you're seeing here from a manuscript. And as you can see, uh, they show bubbles, something you've lit, you've put your two disparate elements together, you've lit your fire under them, and they are bubbling together uh, as though it were children playing. Now, you're not having children playing in the center, um, but you have, have uh, I guess you could say, erotic play in the center. So uh, is that similar, nude figures uh, playing? Something even closer, perhaps, is the fountain in the background. And as you can see, there's a lot of sexual activity going on there, um, or erotic activity anyway. Uh, including these two people who are upside down, <laughs> right next to each other. Um, and these two, uh, and these two vessels uh, that are shown in the alchemical text are a very similar shape to the alchemical fountain. One of them shows the two elements are mating, the two elements are, you know, joining together. Uh, and the other one is the turning upside down. It's, you know, as this stuff bubbles, it bubbles around and turns and, and uh, uh, swirls around. 
So it's almost as though they took these two images and put them together for Bosch's little upside down people. <laughs> One of the interesting things too is there are some curious objects that look to be, there are some curious objects that look like uh, glass cylinders, transparent cylinders. You see a few of them there, you know, some, some other ones that are illustrated. And then we have uh, also, you know, I guess the, the 15th, 16th century equivalent of test tubes. You know, as you can see, these glass cylinders. Um, is that a reference to alchemy or is it something else? Incidentally, those uh, two figures you see in this detail where the woman is behind uh, the uh, transparent cylinder and there's a man who's, I think, about the only figure who's wearing clothing besides Christ. Uh, he seems to have a kind of hair shirt or something on a primitive shirt and he's pointing to her. Uh, some people call those figures Adam and Eve. I don't know. There they, they do. Well, you've got your elements bubbling happily together, but eventually all the moisture is out of them. You know, when you do distillation, you usually have a tube that goes into another vessel or beaker. And uh, of course, um, as things boil, uh, that, that uh, steam rises and it goes through the, um, you know, through the tube and uh, then as it cools, reconverts to liquid. Uh, and comes down in the other beaker. And of course, that would be your medicine. But what's left in the first beaker is putrefaction. <laughs> the alchemical stage of putrefaction. When those elements are burnt and blackened and you know, all the moisture and the essence has gone out of them and, and has been distilled into a, uh, something else. Uh, and they call this stage of alchemy Besides putrefaction, they call it hell and uh, likened to a fiery hell. And here we see our alchemical images with the uh, alchemical beaker the, or the alembic uh, in a giant medieval hell mouth burning away. And then down below we see hell as a fiery city. And what do we see here? That fiery city in the background of Bosch's hell. These alchemical vessels take all different shapes. Uh, some of them are shaped like eggs. We'll be seeing one of those in a little bit. Uh, and so here you have this figure that's uh, often called the egg man or sometimes the tree man because his legs seem to be trees and his body seems to be an egg. Um, also, you have these interesting shaped vessels, which you can see here that twist around. And they look a little bit like this bagpipe that you see. Okay, so here we have the tree man or the egg man. Uh, what Lorinda Dixon uh, points out that, you know, you have these people uh, so within him as though it's a kind of satanic tavern. And she thinks those may be the evil alchemists. They're in there somewhere. Um, but you also have this great disc on his head that becomes a kind of ballroom uh, with a giant bagpipe and uh, you know, devils are leading people around as though in a you know perpetual dance forever. Um, and she points out the similarity in shape. Now, let me point something out about the moral interpretation and what they would say about that bagpipe. Bagpipes were considered to be lewd instruments. Um, I can kind of attest to that. Uh, once upon a time, I was in uh, Vicenza in northern Italy, and the next day I was going to be leaving for Germany, so I, this was before the Euro, so I had to kind of hoard my lira because um, I had to pay for my hotel and I had to pay for my meal, and uh, I wasn't sure, you know, didn't want to stretch it that far. But at any rate, the point being that a street musician playing a bagpipe wanted me to give him money, and I was afraid I wouldn't be able to pay for my meal I wouldn't <laughs> if I gave him money. So, you know, I didn't give him money. And he followed me down the street playing from his bagpipe these weird sounds. 
And I could, I could barely keep a straight face because it sounded lewd. It really was. It was mocking. It was lewd. I mean, he wanted me to force me into giving him something. And the thing was, I wished I'd had a tape recorder. Uh, this was long before digital images. Uh, because I thought, oh, God, I wish I could take this back and show my students what it means. Okay, well, that was my encounter with why bagpipes might sound lewd. I was really curious. Um, but there's another one, and it's visual. Um, I'm a student sitting in my class, and I'm looking at this, and uh, I say to my professor, well, why are bagpipes considered to be, you know, lewd instruments? And he looked at me and said, because they are the shape of male genitalia. Okay. A little bit proportionally off, perhaps, but uh, there, there, that's, that's what he said. <laughs> okay, um, so we have both alchemical and uh, moral interpretations of uh, some of these details. They do overlap a bit, incidentally. Okay, back to just remind you what the whole thing looks like. Eden, cavorting, and hell. Now let's close it. Now let's pull those panels closed and see what's painted on the back of Eden and Hell. And this is the earth in the process of creation. According to the alchemical interpretation, the final stage of distillation, and she says it's circular, you can keep doing this over and over again. The final stage of distillation is purification or ablution. And presumably that's when everything is cleansed and you've got your medicine here. Now, besides that, what does this picture just tell us in and of itself? There's an inscription on it. Uh, if you look up in the upper left, there's a little tiny picture of God the Father. And then there's an inscription that goes between uh, both of the panels. And translated, it says from Psalms, uh, something like, He spoke and it was created. So that pretty clearly suggests that this image is showing you the process of creation. As I mentioned, there is a theory that it's the flood of Noah. But as I said, the inscription says creation, and that seems to me to be pretty final. So let's look closer. We see, of course, this crystalline sphere of the earth and instead of things being created on the outside, so, so there's a kind of disc inside, and it looks you know, very watery around the edge, and uh, then you, it seems like land is coming out of the water. You know, it's, it's coming into being. It's transmuting, perhaps, from one thing to another. From nothingness to what air, to liquid, to solid. You know, all different kinds of things here. And you can see that some things look like you're in a pretty normal landscape where others are these weird, are they rocks? What are they? Uh, there's even over here at the uh, far left uh, a little figure that looks like a test tube with a tail or a stick of dynamite, however you interpret it, um, that uh, Lorena Dixon points out as well. Uh, so is this in the world, the, is this the world being transmuted? That creation is a kind of alchemical process of transmutation. And you know, she's, she's got some pictures here to show us. Uh, here you have one of the few surviving alchemical eggs, which you see the actual photograph of a, a, a glass egg, essentially, with a little uh, spout on the side. And then you have the drawings and the, uh, uh, the little paintings. Uh, where you have the earth in a very similar fashion, only much more schematic as a uh, round object, um, actually with a beaker uh, that has a little spout, which our earth does not, and uh, a kind of uh, watery substance within. Um, you have God sort of creating the world, once again in this sort of glass uh, sphere, uh, and you see the trees and the plants all coming into being. And then here is this uh, alchemist who's working, and as you can see, steam is rushing into uh, this, uh, this globe. And here it is again. 
Okay, when I heard her paper, I, I, I mean, I, I, said, I told people I went to scoff because I thought it would be one of the alchemical arguments that were just so esoteric and all that, but she had those pictures. The pictures were, I want to say, the, the pictures were the proof, as it were. Um, there's a cute little story that they tell about Erwin Panofsky. And, um, should say, and he said once, if you want to prove it, don't illustrate it. The joke, of course, very tongue in cheek, was that if you show people the pictures rather than just doing a verbal argument, uh, they might see that your argument is wrong and you can't prove it that way. On the other hand, what he really meant is, you know, if you can see it, you know, that's, that's some evidence. Now, do illustrate it. Uh, that's probably the most convincing evidence, uh, along with the historical, along with the documentary, but uh, certainly is, is uh, something that's, we can see. Okay, so after the lecture, um, after the session, I went up to Lorinda Dixon. I didn't know her then, I know her now. Uh, and I said to her, do you think that this precludes the moral interpretation or you know, could they be read on both levels? I forget exactly how I phrased it. She said, oh no, they can both work together. So I proceeded to come up with a kind of theory about it, uh, which is, the question is, can the moral and alchemical interpretations be reconciled? In other words, if somebody had this alchemical knowledge, this secret knowledge perhaps, and looked at this picture and said, oh yeah, this is the in story, they would understand it. But most people wouldn't. You know, most people would just look at it and see, um, you know, all these uh, uh, curious creatures. And uh, looking at the whole thing, the same way you might look at the Hay Wayne triptych, um, you know, would read it as a moral allegory or a moral lesson. So it seemed to me that, yes, these two interpretations could be reconciled, that different people could read them on different levels. So I answer the question, yes. Both suggest that mankind must under undergo a spiritual distillation, analogous to the alchemical process, if he is to find the elixir of life, the remedy for sin and disease. Now, that elixir could be an actual medicine, but it is also identified with Christ and his expiation of sin. Christ is the elixir of life. And, you know, the virtuous alchemist is going to work uh, essentially with the sacraments of the church, not just thinking he can find some kind of, you know, physical way of uh, solving this whole thing, discovering the elixir of life. At any rate, on one level, the alchemical allegory could be read as a moral or a religious message. And I think probably, you know, when you look at it, it seems to me that that religious message, that moral message, um, you know, people, have, here's where people began, you know, here's where they continued, they continue to sin, and here's where they're going to end up in hell is the most clear. But if you've got that secret knowledge, you can read it alchemically. And they both work together. Okay. We often talk about Bosch's hell scenes, but there actually still exist a few heaven scenes. You see here we have both heaven and hell. Now these are panels that are in the uh, Palazzo Ducale, the Ducal Palace in Venice. And we presume, just from the subject, that the center of uh, either, you know, that either this was a triptych with, um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know whether there's anything on the back of these or not. It may be that the, yeah, that there was a triptych um, and that the back was split. Or it could be that these are from a Vondel altar, in other words, it's going to open up several different ways. 
Um, and then that the center, which is lost, would have been a last judgment. You have two scenes of heaven, two scenes of hell. Now, let's look at heaven first. Heaven's shown two ways. You have a ter terrestrial paradise, this uh, beautiful garden that you enter. If you think back to Jan van Eyck's image of uh, the adoration of the lamb in the Gant altar piece, he showed heaven as this you know, beautiful landscape, this beautiful garden that just went on and on forever. Um, it had uh, churches in it, of course. This one has a beautiful fountain. Uh, there was, of course, the fountain of life uh, in uh, Jan van Eyck's Adoration of the Lamb. And presumably that's what this is as well. But just, just you, know, you can see the angels are, have welcomed people. They're uh, resting or marveling at the, the beauty of heaven. And the other one shows them rising even higher, you might say, the ascent of the blessed to the celestial paradise. And so angels are carrying these people up, and they're going up to this what, cylinder of light. You know, uh, you see light at the end, you know, this, this tunnel of light. And it has been suggested that he's that this has been described in mystical visions as what, the entry you know, into the celestial heaven. One of the things that always intrigues me about this is it reminds me of some of the accounts of near-death experiences. People today who are you know, pronounced dead and then, uh, because usually modern medicine, uh, you know, their heart stops, for example, but they're able to revive them. And sometimes people will come back and say that they saw a tunnel of light with a figure at the end, whom some people, you know, uh, Christians will sometimes identify as Jesus or sometimes, you know, one of their, uh, their parents or grandparents or just someone waiting for them. Um, you know, some people say, no, what they're doing is seeing or dopamines, or just the way the body breaks down as you start to, to die. Uh, you know, it's a purely physical process. Other people think that they are actually having a vision of the afterlife um, and that they are you know, getting ready to enter it. Uh, I don't know whether Bosch ever had such a vision uh, or whether, as I say, the likely source are uh, texts uh, from uh, mystics. But it certainly is uh, intriguing. And then, of course, the other side of it. Hell, the fall of the damned. And, and people here in despair in this, you know, this fiery hell at the bottom. 